Hello and welcome once again to Viral Church. I must admit that when we uh, drew a line under it at the end of the summer, I wasn't expecting to be revisiting Viral Church for this reason. But here we are. The virus persists and the government sees that the right thing to do is for us to keep ourselves to ourselves again for a few weeks. So we'll be here for you once again all through this lockdown. I pray that you will be blessed by our time together as we once more worship through the wonderful medium of the internet. And so we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to tell of your greatness, of all that you are, all that you have done, and all that you have given. We come to tell of your power and might, your mercy, love and goodness. We come to tell of your faithfulness, the promise of your word, the revelation of your Son, the living presence of your Holy Spirit. We come to lift up our voices, to proclaim your wonderful name, to rejoice in your faithfulness and to offer you our worship our thanks, our love and our service. Almighty God, receive this time set aside for you. Accept the worship we bring and speak to us through all that we share. Deepen our sense of wonder, increase our sense of joy strengthen our sense of trust and encourage our sense of thanksgiving. Help us to know you more fully in our hearts so that we may show your greatness more completely in our lives and live always to your glory. Amen. And so we join together as we say the words of the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and beginning to read at verse 14. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, and dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came, and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, Throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We thank God for his words to us today.
It's good when a really well-known passage of scripture like this comes up on the lectionary readings because it's straightforward. We all know what the parable of the talents means. You know, the rich man who goes on a journey is God, the servants are us, uh, and the wicked servant is of course the uh, the baddie, the one who doesn't use the God, the gifts that God has given him. Uh, to serve the kingdom and so he gets thrown out of the kingdom. So that's it. Nice, simple, all done. Or is it? You see the problem with parables is that they are stories and we are here to, we have to interpret them. We have to try and understand that what just what it was that Jesus was was trying to get at. And the thing is, if we really want to understand the meaning and the significance of what was written, we have to understand the references within it, the culture uh, to which it was being told. Because those will affect how we understand it. Because how we hear a story and how the people of Jesus' time would have heard a story can be quite dramatically different and it makes makes interpretation of these stories sometimes quite difficult and the parent parable of the talents is one of those stories where as soon as you start to think about it a little bit and try and get away from that first normal understanding and reading that we've all had around us for so long, you start to discover issues that you make makes you think, hang on, is that really true? So for a start off, who is the rich landowner? And we tend to assume that the rich landowner is God. The theologian Ben Myers wrote uh, 10 rules for uh, interpreting parables and for preaching on parables. And the first rule was, don't assume that God is necessarily one of the characters in the parable. And I think that's a trap that often we fall into. We start looking for the key characters and say, well, which one of these is God? But does that central character really represent God? We're not told a lot about him other than he was a, a rich landowner. But we are told a couple of things. And the first is that he goes away, which isn't sort of very much within the picture of God that we or the, the Jews of Jesus' time would have held that he goes off on this long journey and leaves his people in charge. That's not actually that godlike. But the other problem is the description of him uh, at the end of the story. You reap where you do not sow. There's a, a capitalism, a greediness uh, about this landowner. And that doesn't really fit with the image of God either that we, that we would normally have. So does this sort of cast an issue? The other thing is the whole premise of the, of the story if we, if we read it in that way. And that is basically that greed is good. The accumulation of wealth is the most important thing. Those who double the money that they have been given are rewarded. Those, the one who doesn't, is punished. It's a bit like the prosperity gospel that we, we see so much of today. And it, it makes me uncomfortable to think that that is something that the Bible is teaching us. It's interesting what that third person does, that third servant or slave does with his money. Because he takes the money that he's been given 
and he buries it. He doesn't invest it. And in fact, when, the, when, his, when his owner returns and asks what happened to the money, he says, well, you know, you've not earned me any money at all. You could at least have put it with the bankers and it would have earned me some interest. And we think, yeah, that makes sense. But to a Jew of Jesus's time, that would have been quite scandalous. Earning interest or usury, as it was called, on money was prohibited. If you read Deuteronomy 23, 19 to 20. So actually, the man who buried the money in the ground was doing what a good Jew should do. He was not earning usury. And that sort of gives another current to this whole story. This greed would have been actually so much contrary to the whole Jewish concept of society. Their society was not a society that valued money or things. It was a society that valued honour. It was how you behaved that was important. And the behaviour of this man would have been scandalous. It's not quite as straightforward as it looks, is it? You know, there's so much more that you can dig into. There, that's just one possible reading. And I'm not going to tell, say to you now that it isn't without its problems. It doesn't all, that the body of the story there doesn't always seem to tie up quite with the, with the ending of it. There's another thought that uh, actually the story is intended to be having a go at the Pharisees about the things that God had entrusted to them and they had failed to, uh, to use. So actually, we're not 100% sure what this story means. There are several lessons that we can learn from it. Perhaps the most important one, though, is don't learn one interpretation of a passage of Scripture and assume it's the only one. And always read scripture critically. Look for the inconsistencies. You know, does what the passage actually say line up with the interpretation that I'm putting on it? In this case, I find the answer is no. That that image of God doesn't sit nicely with the traditional understanding. And so I will continue to wrestle with this parable. And I hope that you will continue to wrestle with Scripture too. So we come to our time of prayer for others. Let us pray. Lord, let us be ever vigilant in our watching for you. You come to us, make us aware of you. Bless your church that it may know you and love you, that it may love you and serve you, that it may serve you and proclaim you, that it may proclaim you and enjoy you forever. Lord, your kingdom come. Come, Lord, to your people who yearn for your peace. Come to your people who cry for your love. Come to your people who search for your joy. Come to all who walk in darkness and bring your light. We pray that the kingdoms of the world may become the kingdom of Christ the Lord. Lord, your kingdom come. 
come to our homes and reveal your love. Come, heal our divisions. Increase our faith in you and in each other. Strengthen our fellowship through your presence. Guide our actions by the power of your Spirit. We pray for our friends and for all that we share. Lord, your kingdom come. We remember before you all who are world weary. We pray for those who are weary of serving others for those who are weary of their own lives, for lives that lack love, joy or peace, for all who have lost hope. We pray for healers and for peacemakers. We remember all who are in sickness. Lord, your kingdom come. We give thanks for all who have triumphed over darkness and death, for the great kingdom of the redeemed. We entrust to you our homes, our friends, our loved ones, and pray that we may share with your saints in everlasting glory. Lord, your kingdom come your will be done. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us once again here as we have worshipped together. I pray that God will have blessed you and touched your life through the words and the music that we have shared today. Next week, Kina will be leading our worship, so I do hope you will be able to join us again then. But for now, we ask God's blessing. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and remain with us forever. Amen.